God of War Ragnarok was possibly the best 22 hours I've spent on a video game in a very long, long time. Throughout my playthrough, I focused mainly on the story mode and found throughout that I have so much else to sink my teeth into after the game was complete and I can't wait to jump back in and finish it off. However, today I wanted to spend a bit of time specifically going through and explaining what happened during the story in God of War Ragnarok, how it links to the first game and how Kratos and Atreus' journey comes to a close. If you guys do go on to enjoy today's video, do consider leaving a like, it'd be very, very much appreciated. And why not consider subscribing to the channel as well, for plenty more God of War content coming, and plenty of other games also. But, let's dive straight in. God of War Ragnarok begins with Kratos sitting slumped over a fire inside of a cave somewhere within Midgard. He's reminiscing over the bag which carried the ashes of his deceased wife Faye, still mourning her passing despite the events of the first game, with Ragnarok taking place a few years into the future from then. Atreus walks in with a deer that he'd recently caught hunched over his back, with both of them agreeing to go back home due to the weather becoming worse. As they load up the sled, Atreus pulls out an object of some sort that we're not too familiar with, trying to hide and keep it a secret from Kratos. However, as we're journeying home, Atreus spots an eagle in the distance, which suddenly transforms into a person. It was Freya. In the first game, the god before and killed Boulder was Freya's son. Freya cast a spell on Boulder to prevent him from feeling anything. The warmth, the cold, the touch of a woman, pain or anything, in order to just simply try and protect him. However, this only made Boulder hate Freya more, with Freya giving Boulder the option to kill her at the end of the game but Kratos would not allow that to happen. From that point onwards, Freya would never forgive Kratos, not just for denying her of death, but for the grief it caused her in knowing that the man that killed her son is still out there. Freya has been hunting Kratos specifically for a long time, and Kratos simply refused to fight back due to the help that she gave us in the first game, like saving Atreus' life. We eventually escape the wrath of Freya and return to our home in Midgard. Atreus mentions that there's another wolf, Fenrir, that was severely sick in that it was Atreus' first wolf. Kratos and Atreus essentially captured and saved the wolves in their possession from a camp of rebels that were planning on eating them a while back. However, when Atreus gets to Fenrir, it was apparent that he was very near the end, and Atreus finally has to let him go. Fenrir died in Atreus' arms. However, once it did happen, a blue orb floated out of Fenrir's body. Kratos catches it with one eye, but says nothing more on the matter. Kratos walks inside the cabin whilst Atreus finds a place to bury Fenrir, when Atreus doesn't come back. Kratos and Amir go searching for Atreus when suddenly they're attacked by a bear. It turns out that Atreus has the power to turn into different animals depending on his feelings. Anger and rage was the feeling at the time, so that's what he turned into. Completely uncontrollable at the moment. The three of them return back to the cabin to rest, when suddenly, a storm hits. The ball. I'm sure we'll find lots to talk about. They rush to the front door and when opened, are greeted with a cloaked figure standing there. Thor. It's really good to know that the Avengers were lore accurate when depicting this image of Thor. Thor asks Kratos if he can come in for a chat. Kratos being very, very wary of this. However, he eventually says okay, and Thor walks into the cabin and sits down, placing his hammer on the table. And just to show dominance, Kratos does the same with his axe. They both started talking to begin with, both very tense about the situation, with of course Kratos killing Magni and Atreus killing Modi in the first game, both sons of Thor. However, as the situation begins to get more tense, 
in walks Odin. They started by reiterating that they do not wish for war, that they would leave them both alone if they swear to not continue to look for the god Tyr. Odin tries to put it down as Tyr being dead to try and stop Atreus from looking. However, Atreus was secretly searching for Tyr without Kratos knowing due to his connection with the giants and his desire to find out more about the shrine that he found in Jotunheim. Atreus wants the giants to repopulate Jotunheim again and he thinks Tyr could help with this, help find out more about himself and for Tyr to lead the army of the giants against Odin and take him down for good. Isn't it? So what do you say? Don't take all day. About time. Kratos declines this offer from Odin, and Thor strikes him with his hammer, and they fight off into the distance. However, during this time, Odin decided to stick around and speak with Atreus, telling him more of how he could help him get the answers that he's looking for and that if he ever wanted help finding them, to meet Odin in Asgard. Atreus is a young kid that wants nothing more than to find out his overall meaning in life, and more around his shrine and the prophecy, so of course this is going to intrigue him. However, now that Odin and Thor know of their home's location, it is not safe there anymore. Sindri and Brock invite them into their home and stay low for a while until they can figure out what the next steps are. At this time though, Atreus brings up the meaning behind the artifact that he was holding at the beginning of the game. He found it in one of the shrines, and Mimir mentioned that it was the craftsmanship of the giants. This shrine revealed that Tyr, the Midgardian god of war, and the god who helped the giants, was in prison somewhere. However, the location was not revealed within the shrine. Brock and Sindri inform us of a dwarf based in Svartalhain, a dwarf named Durilin. Durilin was at the forefront of a rebellion against Odin, with Faye helping to lead that rebellion. We travel to the realms of Svartalhain and meet with Durilin, who could immediately recognize the blade on Kratos' back, believing that he and Atreus had killed Faye, knowing that it was Faye's axe, and not knowing that she was Kratos' wife. In knowing this, Durilin presents Kratos and Atreus with a fine, in which bewilders the two at the time. However, when exiting the house, Atreus checks this fine, and finds that it is in fact a map of a nearby mine. The mine in which Tia could be held captive in by Odin. Kratos, Atreus and Mimir make their way up through the mountain and into the mine, breaching through four green doors, when finally they find what they're looking for. Tia. Tia was weak, fragile and not the god that he once was. Not believing in violence and not wanting any part of what they're preaching to him. He was kept captive by Odin for an extremely long time being tortured for his axe and not revealing the path to Jotunheim, so you can see why he was a bit sceptical. Kratos grabs Tyr and gives him the talking to that is needed at the time, saying that we've come all of this way for you, and my son believes in you. So in doing so, Tyr returns with us to Brock and Sindri's home. However, Tyr insists that he would prefer to sleep inside a broom closet in the house, saying that he's used to the pitch black dark and wants to be there, and doesn't want to take up any more space than what's needed. This seems really odd, you know, with Tia being a god, but more on this later. In this section of the game, we take control of Atreus for the first time, which I thought was really, really cool. The next step was very blurred, with no one really knowing what else to do or where to go from here. Atreus takes Sindri to Midgard in order to try and speak to Jormungandr, the World Serpent. This was to try and find out more around the meaning of Loki and where they need to go next. Atreus summons the World Serpent from under the thick layer of ice, in which he responds with Ironwood. Not knowing what this meant at the time, the two were very frustrated and thought that they'd wasted a trip there. However, Atreus decided to try his luck speaking with Freya. She only wanted to kill Kratos, so he might be able to reason with her and maybe even talk Freya into taking their side in the fight against Odin 
and helping them find answers. Freya, though, was not of the same mind frame. She listened to what Atreus had to say, even at times looking pretty shocked, but resulting in the same resolve. Leave this place. Go and do not return. Go before I change my mind. Do not expect the same mercy for your father. We return back to Midgard where positive progress was made around next steps. There was a god named Grower in the realm of Alfheim, which would potentially provide us more information on the prophecy and what we needed to do next. The shrine revealed to us that the prophecy that Odin was working from was in fact wrong, and that Odin is working off a lie. Grower had a vision when meditating one time for weeks on end. She was trying to find her lost husband, Freya, Freya's brother. Their parents were very creative when choosing their names. It was during this vision that Grower had the vision of Ragnarok. Word of the vision reached Odin and Odin demanded a private retelling of the vision. Odin didn't like what he heard relating to Ragnarok and he killed Grower. It was at this point that we see Ironwood mentioned there. This was the same phrase that Jormungandr mentioned to us earlier. Ironwood is a mythical sanctuary for the giants. However, Ironwood has never been found and it's not known to anyone, even Mimir, stating that it's just not a real place. We also get a glimpse of the champion of the war, which Atreus believes is him, eventually showing Ragnarok, a battle between each of the nine realms, all gods and all beings. However, it then moves to show someone leading the forces against Odin. However, Tyr does not want war and finds it hard to come to terms with that he could be again the god of war. However, suddenly the vision shifts, and no one has seen this side of the prophecy before. The giant of Ragnarok destroys Asgard, leaving the other eight realms to thrive, and Odin to die. Groa lied to Odin. The vision was false, and the prophecy that Odin's searching for is incorrect. They all return back to Brock and Sindri's house, where Atreus goes into his room to sleep. However, before closing his eyes, he pulls out the giant artifact from the beginning of the game, closes his eyes and says, Ironwood. Atreus falls asleep, but suddenly wakes up somewhere extremely unfamiliar. When here he encounters all of his older memories from the first game, going through the phase of his resentment between him and his father, his pure cockiness as well. I mean, just knowing we're gods makes me feel so much stronger. Where am I? It's all you ever talk about, over and over. Do something about it or shut up or it. Little people's little We're problems. We're sick of hearing about little people's little problems. Memories and not nice ones. You broke the gate. That was our only way to Jotunheim. What do you want? Let go, Druma. I don't understand. Whatever. 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 Hey! Don't run up! When suddenly, he falls through the ground, and moments later finds himself in a place surrounded by wildlife. Somewhere that he's never been before. He's escorted to a location by a pack of wolves when he meets Angraboa. Angraboa's prophecy is to tell Atreus of his prophecy. So she takes him back to her home and shows him the rest of the shrine that was destroyed in the Jotunheim temple. However, it wasn't what he was expecting, nor what Atreus wanted. The prophecy shows him holding his father in his arms, with Kratos ending up dead at the hands of Thor, and Odin, with Loki eventually going to work for Odin. Atreus snaps and turns into a wolf, trying to channel his rage and destroy the shrine. The missing piece of the shrine in the Jotunheim Tower did not show this final part, the death of his father and Atreus going to work with Odin. Angraboa had one more thing to show Atreus though before he left. She took Atreus to the location in Jotunheim where we could see the temple that we travelled to at the end of the first game. However, she explained that Jotunheim is in fact not full of bodies of dead giants like we thought it probably was at the end of the first game. As you can see on screen right now, it looks very much alike. But rocks making you believe that it is. Jotunheim is full of rocks to make you believe that it's full of giants' bodies that just lay dormant and dead. This is so that if Odin ever wants to come to Jotunheim, 
that he would take a look and believe that all the giants here are in fact dead, but really, it's just rocks, without giving him additional reasons to go further and investigate. It's pretty sad to be honest with the people of Jotunheim. We reach one of the rocks and Angraboda hands us a bag. This bag contained a bunch more of these marble type things that we'd found from the first shrine. These were not created and left by the giants. These things are the giants. The giants unfortunately didn't really have a choice. They could stay in Jotunheim to wait for Odin to find a way in and just slaughter them, or they could hide in these marbles. It's within these marbles that they find peace in not being hunted anymore. Their souls are within these marbles and their bodies are just left to rot and die away. These souls can be passed into creatures or bodies with no souls within, like we see later into the game when one of the souls were passed into a snake. This was huge power given to Atreus, and he didn't want the responsibility to do that. So he gives them back to Angraboda and says that he wants her to take them for now. However, before Atreus left Ironwood, Angraboda gives him one final marble, and it was his mother's marble. Unfortunately though, there was no soul within it due to her dying within her body in the first game, but it was better in his hands. However, before Atreus left Ironwood, Angraboda told him that he must not tell anyone about Ironwood, even his father. If Odin found out about it, he would find his way into Ironwood and ultimately Jotunheim, and that is real bad news. Atreus returns home to the cabin and when trying to move through the portal, Kratos was standing there, happy to see Atreus but also furious at the same time. It turns out that Atreus was gone for two whole days, which only felt like a couple of hours to him, as ultimately time moves faster in Jotunheim. However, they were suddenly both ambushed by a Valkyrie, which turned out to be Freya. Kratos didn't fight back once he found out who it was, with Atreus even turning into a bear just as Freya was about to kill Kratos. However, Kratos jumped into action, saving Freya from being mauled by Atreus as a bear. Freya turned around in disbelief that Kratos would save her like that, essentially risking his life to do so. Freya decided instead to use Kratos to help free herself, but instead of killing Kratos, she decided that he was more used to her alive at this time using him to free herself from the spell that Odin cast upon her, binding her to Midgard. Freya and Odin were once married a long time ago, and to prevent her from travelling to other realms, he cast a spell on her. And that was what we'd seen in the very first game. She was unable to come with us to Alfheim due to the spell that was binding her, which was the reason why she was ripped away. We take a trip to Valheim, progress through and free Freya from the spell binding her to Midgard. And upon returning to camp, she's finally reunited with her brother, Freya. Freya left when he'd found out that, one, Odin had killed his wife Groa, and two, found out that Freya was marrying him. He never went searching for her because he thought that she was dead. But really, she was just bound to Midgard this whole time, so could never move between realms. However, they both forged a plan to work together to take down Odin. We return back to the cabin and Kratos tries his best to get out of Atreus where he was and where he's been, but Atreus was unable to say anything about Ironwood. All the characters in the house were all pushing Atreus to tell him where he'd been, telling Atreus that if he was in Asgard, that Odin is bad news and he's using him to get to his end goal, in which Atreus responds, so am I. Atreus at the time cannot tell anyone about Ironwood, so with the rest of the group connecting the dots and with Odin inviting him into Asgard, that's where they all believe that he went. Atreus angers at the accusations and turns himself into a bear, going through the portal and landing into Midgard. However, as he's walking through, we can hear the sound of ravens in the distance. He eventually finds Odin's personal raven and says he's ready. Take me to Odin. Atreus ends up in Asgard and begins to climb the Great Wall. At the top, he's greeted by someone named Heimdall. Heimdall didn't believe Atreus was here for to see Odin for a second, and even almost dropped him to his death at the very top of the wall. However, he gave him the benefit of the doubt and took him to Odin's lodge. Heimdall began toying with Atreus. Heimdall cannot be touched by anyone bearing in mind. He can essentially see your every move, even before you can see your move. Until Thor turns up. Heimdall stands down, however, proceeds to tell Odin that he believes the boy is fake. He believes he's there to betray him. 
in which Odin replies, of course he is. He has no reason to trust me yet. Odin shows us around Asgard, the camp, the training of the soldiers, and even how he has an unlimited army. A soldier will go to Valhalla when he dies in battle, then drop straight back down into Asgard, where Odin recruits them back to his army, resulting in an endless cycle of troops. Odin gives Atreus his own room, which used to belong to Magni, the son of Thor, which Kratos killed in the first game, so it's pretty bittersweet to be honest. This is where we meet Thrud, Magni and Modi's sister, the daughter of Thor, and also Sif, Thor's wife. We meet up with Odin once settled, and he informs us of his overall plan, and why Odin wants our help. Odin states he doesn't want Ragnarok, war, or the end of the world, but something that could give them the answers to everything. Answers to why the gods were here, learn how to change their fate, save the people they love, and much more. Of course, this is right up Atreus' street. He knows the overall prophecy and the end goal, and he knows that his father, in the shrine, is going to die. So if he can change that fate and save his father, of course he's going to work with Odin. And Odin knew that this plays straight into his hands, and we'll know why a little bit later on into the video. Odin, as a young god, found a piece of a mask. A mask that will let you look into the crack of time, which was situated under his log cabin. The mask is required. However, the mask is 100% required to do this, as when Odin tried to do this without the mask, he lost his right eye. The task that Odin needs from Atreus is to recraft the mask and make it into its full form. They need to make it whole again so that they can look within the crack and find as many answers as they can. This is what is driving Odin, and this is why he needs Atreus' help. This will give him the ability to change the prophecy as he sees fit, which could be catastrophic in his own right. We are sent on a mission to find the first piece of the mask with Thor in Muspelheim, and this was a success. However, during this time, we find another shrine in the distance, so we trick Thor into doing something else whilst we sneak off and look inside it. It was there that we met Angraboa again. She decided to rewrite her own prophecy and search for more of the giant's marbles within the shrine, so she's traveling the Nine Realms. It was within this shrine that they found how Ragnarok is formed. The gods of Muspelheim, Samara, and Suta combine and form a large creature known as Ragnarok. They find the part of the mask they're looking for and return back to Odin, where they finish their first mission together. We move back to the perspective of Kratos. They are all in conversation about what to do next, and Freya comes to the conclusion that war on Asgard is what she will follow if that's what the prophecy states. However, Tyr is not prepared to go down this route, with there being countless innocent lives lost in the process just because of a prophecy. There must be another way. Freya has the idea to speak with a species called the Norms. The Norms are a species who know of the prophecy and can recite it well. They can predict your every word, even ones you're not thinking at the time. However, they're also a species that don't want to be found. Kratos wants to ask the Norms how to find his son, and if there's any way to get him back from Asgard, and even to change the fate of the prophecy. We finally reach the Norms after searching long for them. The Norms talk to us about the prophecy, that Kratos will die, and that Heimdall will try to kill Atreus in Asgard. They leave and make their way back to the house with this new information. Kratos informs the group that Heimdall will try to kill Atreus, and that we must do what we can to stop it. However, the problem is, Heimdall can see your every move even before you know it yourself. How is anyone supposed to combat that? However, Brock and Sindri believe to know a way, and that's to use something called a drop near. This mineral was stolen by the dwarfs a long time ago, and was done to keep it away from Odin, with him having so much influence over Svartalhain. Why will it help kill Heimdall? Well, when it's combined with another mineral, it can be thrown and detonated remotely by Kratos or the person that's using it, stunning Heimdall, allowing Kratos to attack him and essentially kill him. Heimdall isn't only Odin's right-hand man though, he also carries the horn in which begins Ragnarok, the Gala Horn. We take these minerals to the forge in Svartalheim, specifically though, to the Lady of the Forge. Once we get there, we walk into a lift, which descends under the water. It was here we met the Lady of the Forge for the first time, and she crafted a spear out of the ingredients that we gathered. 
return back to the house with the spear, and switch back to the perspective of Atreus in Asgard. Odin had another mission to retrieve another piece of the mask, and to accompany him doing this was Thrud and Heimdall. They visit Helheim and follow the mask throughout, until they reach their destination, guarded by a huge wolf named Garm. Garm was chained up and Atreus thought that he knew what to do here. He thought he knew what Garm wanted, and that was to be free. If Garm was free, they could just walk straight past him and get the mask. Without knowing why he was chained up, probably wasn't the best idea. Atreus and Thrud free the wolf and, to their surprise, a dead end. We return back and meet with Heimdall, who explains why Garm was chained up. It was because the wolf is able to create tears between the different realms, allowing things from Helheim to move between the realms and infiltrate them and cause chaos. This means that the enemies of Helheim are going to be able to move between the different realms now with no problems at all. We return to Asgard and Odin confronts us on what we've done. We tell Odin of the mistake that we've made and advise that we just want to go home now. We use Odin's ravens and it takes us back to our cabin. As we step through the portal though, there was a tear in between realms from Helheim to Sindri's house. This was because Garm tore a hole from Helheim to our current location, resulting in an attack. Freya and Atreus close the hole and he is reunited with his father. Atreus tells the group of his mistake when freeing Garm, stating he had no idea of the damage that it would cause. So Kratos tells Atreus that he will go to Helheim with him and fix this mess, which is exactly what they did. Atreus and Kratos both reach Helheim, and they both defeat Garm for the first time. However, a short time later, he comes straight back. It was later found that there's no killing Garm, because he has no soul to kill. He just keeps coming straight back, regenerating his health back to full. Atreus has an idea though. Like the snake earlier on in the game, he decides to transfer a soul into Garm. But not any soul. Fenrir. At the beginning of the game, we spoke about that blue light that appeared once Fenrir died. This was Atreus transferring Fenrir's soul into his knife, which he didn't know he was doing. Atreus had no idea there was a soul in his knife until Angraboda told him in Ironwood, and this is where he got the idea from. Once he did this, Garm ran off, and then found him under a cavern in Helheim as we progressed through near to the exit. Atreus approached Garm, at first very, very timid and very wary, but then it was truly Fenrir, just in a completely different form. Kratos as well couldn't believe it, as well as myself, it was awesome to be honest. Of course, Fenrir couldn't stay here, so Kratos instructs Fenrir to go home, in which he tears through the realms and goes back to the cabin. We make our way back to Brock and Sindri's house, and Atreus spends a bit more time showing everyone what Odin's up to. Atreus mentioned the mask, and Mimir mentioned that it was just a dead end, that it wasn't really anything special. However, when Tyr looked at it, he said the mask has great significance. It's a way to gaze into the secrets of creation itself, a way to find out the purpose behind everything and everyone. Becoming one with a source of infinite knowledge, this was the reason that Odin tortured Tyr. However, knowing that the prophecy states Kratos kills Heimdall, Freya wants to know if we should focus on killing him right now or not. Even if he was, how would we get to Asgard? Kratos doesn't want to return to the person that he once was. He does not want to be a killer of gods anymore, and he tries his best to rewrite fate by seeking alternative routes to killing Heimdall or just not killing him at all. Freya decides that if we don't take the fight to Odin, that she's going to return to Vanaheim in the meantime to help her brother prepare for the battle against Odin should he ever return there. Kratos and Atreus also decide to follow in help in any way that they can. However, just like fate, there's Heimdall in Vanaheim. Kratos and Heimdall fight, utilizing the spear that was created by Brock and Sindri, and it worked. Kratos was the first person to ever hit Heimdall, in which he took him down. Despite defeating Heimdall though, Kratos didn't want to be that god killer anymore and decided to spare Heimdall's life. However, Heimdall found it insulting that Kratos didn't finish the job and fought back and eventually left Kratos with no choice but to kill him on the battlefield. We return back to Brock and Sindri's home where we discuss what happens next. Now that Heimdall is dead, it's only a matter of time before Asgard finds out. So Atreus uses this time to revisit Odin and find the final piece of the mask. Odin requested that we go with Thor on this journey. However, we had to fetch him first. Thor was drunk and left in a bar. 
Thor was essentially an alcoholic and passed the time by drinking away his sorrows of his childhood and his life right now. So we tried to get him out of the bar, and in doing so, we started a bar brawl. He eventually gets out and comes with us, even if he was being sick along the way. We finally find a piece of the mask that we were looking for, and suddenly, Odin appears out of nowhere, along with Sif and two Valkyries. Sif found out that Heimdall was in fact killed, and Sif then goes on to talk Thor into wanting to kill Atreus for one, killing Heimdall, and two, killing Magni and Modi along with Baldir. Atreus was given a one-time use device by Sindri before he went into Asgard. If he wanted to get out and go back to the location of the home at any given time, he just throws it on the floor as hard as possible. Luckily, he had that because he needed to use that right now to escape Thor's wrath. And he did that and was back at the realm tree where Kratos was waiting for him and they went back to the house. They returned back to the house and discussed what had happened. Atreus got no real answers from the completed mask, meaning all he really did was steal Odin's greatest treasure just after Kratos killed his most loyal ally. Freya wants to start the war now. However, again, Tia is very against doing so, not wanting to kill every soul in Asgard just to get one man. Tia then goes on to say that the plan is staring us clear in the face. We should slip into Asgard ourselves and use the mask to figure out what it means. We can do it right under Odin's nose without him even knowing. We can gain the knowledge to shatter the prophecy and end the war once and for all. However, how do we get into Asgard? We can't use the Galahorn as it sounds across all of the realms. They would see us coming. Atreus thinks looking into the mask is a good idea though. We can forge our own path and get the answers and stop the war. Then nobody has to die. But again, the question, how do we get into Asgard undetected? Tia stands and steps forward and says that he knows he's been a burden to us all, even though we've saved him from imprisonment but he's now ready to step forward, picking up his spear one last time, and Tia will lead them to Asgard. Brock immediately fires back with a question. If you've got a way into Asgard, where's this idea been the entire time? Kratos and Mimir state the same thing back to Tia. Why would he withhold Asgard from us, and why is it only coming up now, now that the mask is complete? He states it's because it would have gotten everyone killed, and we needed time for Loki to find his destiny, the mask. Everything led to this. If the mask doesn't work out, we'll still have the drop on them because we'll be there with surprise. But then again, Brock fires back. Brock wants to know of this new way into Asgard. Tia mentioned that it's an ancient path and it can't be reached from here, but Brock is having none of it. Where then? And why is he walking off with the mask? That's the boy's property. He earns it. Tia said he's going to collect his things, but Tia has no things. He didn't come with anything. He was a prisoner for centuries. Nothing is welding together correctly here. Why is Tia calling Atreus Loki? He's done nothing but make food. He's never fought with us and also turns up late when we do. And when the battle's finished, he turns up with his shield, almost like he was somewhere else when it was taking place. He's never around when Atreus is in Asgard. So what's going on? Tyr turns around and stabs Brock straight in the stomach. However, it wasn't Tyr all this time. It was Odin. Odin takes the mask and tries to get away. However, just as Odin disappears, Kratos throws his spear through the eye of the mask and pierces it to the wall. Brock dies on the floor in Sindri's arms. Tyr was never really there. Odin played Atreus this entire time and the rest of the group. He knew that Kratos refused the offer at the beginning of the game. He knew that Atreus would continue his search for Tia, which is why he used this to his advantage, to find out their every move and to shapeshift himself into Tia's form. This was why Odin was so calm about Atreus being in Asgard this entire time. He had a gateway to both sides. Odin was using Atreus to build the mask and to look into this crack of knowledge, whilst at the same time finding their entire plan whilst Atreus and the rest of the group thought that they were against Odin and outsmarting him. He really, really played them here. He was there when they were looking into all of the shrines and found out that Groa lied as well, so he was well-versed on this new prophecy. Kratos hands the Galahorn to Fae, 
and both him and Atreus walk out of the house and return home. They both take some time away to grieve and mourn the death of Brock, before returning to the house to plan their next steps. This was it, the home stretch. Ragnarok is coming, and we need to be ready for it. The group gathered around the table in Brock and Sindri's house to form a plan as to how they're going to attack, how they were going to find and finally defeat Odin and destroy Asgard. The group are going to unite all of the realms against Odin. They've now completely lost the elements of surprise as Odin now knows everything that they were planning with him being in the form of Tyr this entire time. However, this will not stop them. They need to forge an army of their own, an army that spans across all of the other eight realms. We need to still get past that huge wall protecting Odin's camp, the Wall of Asgard. In order to do this, they need Suter. Suter is the god of Mieselheim, along with his wife, Samara. Suter is the god that will turn into Ragnarok and essentially destroy Asgard like we see in Groa's visions, just as it's shown in the shrine. Hildesvini, the boar that was shot in the first game, who is now human and friends with Freya, will travel to Helheim to recruit the army of the dead. Freya will return to Alfheim to reunite the elves, light and the dark, even after centuries of war. And Freya will return to Vanaheim to find Singram to muster all of the free Valkyries of that realm. That only leaves Svartalhain. Sindri is still mourning the death of his brother, however he agreed to help. Freya picks up the Galahorn and hands it back to Kratos. We get Suta and tell him of the plan to summon Ragnarok. However, when we get to Suta, he says that he doesn't want to help. This is because he knows of the prophecy already, and he knows what must be done to combine himself and Samara together to form Ragnarok. But he doesn't want Samara to die, so he forges together another plan. The Blades of Chaos Kratos holds on his back are filled with primordial fire. This will be enough to start Ragnarok. So, Suta leads us to the spark of the world to begin the process. We move to the edge and place the blades into the heart of Suta. This then starts the process of Ragnarok. We return to Midgard and make our way to Tyr's temple, where all of the gods of the realms are situated, just waiting for Ragnarok to happen. Freya looks to Kratos and says that she wants him to be the general, to lead the armies into battle. This is not who Kratos wanted to be remembered by, but having an experienced general leading them into battle, there will be nothing better than that and it will probably help them to go on and win this war and make those difficult decisions in those difficult times. Kratos sleeps on it and in the morning agrees to be the general leading the armies into the battle. Kratos leads the rest of the army into Tyr's temple and blows the Galahorn, marking the beginning of Ragnarok. We enter into Asgard through the temple and see all of the surrounding realm towers there too. This scene was so cool, it literally reminds me of that ending Avengers Endgame scene. It was just so sick. You see the giant serpent in the background, you see Ragnarok in there as well, all the dragons flying around, all the different enemy types you fought throughout the first game, the second game. It was just, this honestly was one of the best fight scenes I've played in a long time for gaming. So. Well done, team. <laughs> However, it was found that Odin has a series of war machines set up and ready, waiting to destroy any towers that will show up, trying to shut out Ragnarok. This was the first objective when we got there, destroy the war machines. We get to the Svartalhain Tower, and there's no sign of the dwarfs anywhere. Sindri comes through though, however, and says that no more dwarfs are dying for this. Odin forced them to build these war machines, and he knows a way to take them down on his own. 
still very bitter with Kratos and Atreus for leading Odin into his home and killing his brother as obviously everyone can imagine and appreciate. However, suddenly, there comes Ragnarok. Odin's war machines are trying to stop them, but Sindri destroys them, allowing him to progress further. However, in doing so, we see a bunch of Midgardians that Odin took in. Odin was using them as collateral damage, basically placing them there to die, slowing down Kratos and his army from getting to him, knowing that they would rather try and save them or have to go straight through them. Kratos and Atreus forge a plan to save the Midgardians and try to take out Odin themselves as they believed they could do that. However, one problem with that, they needed to slow down Ragnarok, so they needed to try their best to slow him down, which, as you can imagine, was not an easy task to try and do. Kratos and Atreus break the wall themselves and go after Odin. We finally reach the wall as Atreus, and there we find Thrude, who thinks that we've betrayed her. We tell Thrude that Odin has sacrificed the Midgardians to slow her down, and all of her friends that were there are most likely dead. Thrude doesn't believe us, but then out of nowhere, Sif walks in as well with one of Thrude's friends. This was her mother and Thor's wife. She walks around and explains the exact same thing as we were, that Odin is bad news and that he cannot be trusted. It was at this stage that Thrude joined our forces and we make a stand and be better. We all partner together, break the wall and push in to find Odin. We pushed her into the wall and suddenly Thor comes flying out of nowhere, grabbing Kratos and pulling him towards the Odin's lodge, thinking that we're going to hurt his daughter or trying to combat her, not knowing that she's working with us and that Sif also told her the same. Thor is just trying to do right by his father Odin and not knowing the current situation. Unfortunately, we have to battle with Thor. He doesn't want to listen to us, even though we are trying to explain to him throughout the battle that we're working to only take down Odin and that Sif and also Thrud are working with us. In the end, when we defeat Thor, we talk to him and try and reason with him after we've beat him. We eventually actually got through to Thor and made him see clear that Odin was the monster here and he needs to make his own choices, stand up to his father. For the sake of his children, he needs to be better. Odin then suddenly shows up questioning Thor why he's not killed Kratos. Thor stands proud and finally says no to Odin. However, in return, Odin stabs a spear straight through his heart, killing Thor for good, and he just whittles away. Odin picks up Thor's hammer and hits Thrud, whilst Kratos and Atreus are left to fight against him. We fight against Odin and towards the end, he bounds us to the floor, freezing us in place completely and we're just not able to move. However, Freya comes out of nowhere and prevents Odin from doing anything by utilizing a rope that Odin used to try and hang himself a long, long time ago, in which she found on a journey when speaking with the Norms. She had power at this stage, but suddenly Odin threw his raven at her, breaking the spell momentarily, which was enough for him to get the better of us, sending us crashing down into his basement. However, the mask is now completed, and Atreus is right next to the knowledge crack. This crack in time allows you to see and know all. Odin speaks with Loki. No more fighting, he says. This is your moment, Loki. This is your purpose, your prophecy. With Kratos also walking forward, stating that it's your choice, Atreus, on what happens next. Loki breaks the mask into two pieces, with him falling into the crack and lost to the world. Odin rages at this and attacks us for the second time. We fortunately get the better of Odin, in which Atreus tries to reason with him. Odin says that the crack was the way to make the Nine Realms better, a way to help people. But no, Atreus went back and said that it was all about you, never about the good of the people, saying that he had no choice but to kill Thor. There was no other option. Atreus said that you have to stop. You can choose to be better. With Odin simply responding, no, I can't. I will never stop. He has to know what happens next. There was clearly no saving Odin here. So Atreus does something that, to be honest, we probably didn't expect. Atreus takes the soul out of Odin and places it into a marble that was created and housed the giants. There will be no afterlife for Odin, there will be no Valhalla because he died in battle. He will be placed in this marble for the rest of time. However, out of nowhere, Sindri takes the marble and smashes it. That's for killing his brother. 
Ragnarok finally reaches them. They need to find a way out of there immediately, else they're of course going to die and be destroyed along with the rest of Asgard. However, suddenly, there comes Fenrir and Angraboda to save the day. Freya decides to stay and hold off Ragnarok whilst the others escape. However, Atreus was late to entering the portal as well, cussing him massively and resulting in him to be unconscious for a long period of time. As we can see, his father's rushing him to some care. We wake up in a Midgardian temple, and as we move through, we come across all of the people that we'd fought alongside in our journey, thanking them, and eventually getting to Angraboda and Fenrir. She tells us that she has something to show us, along with something to show Kratos also. We're led to the very top of the mountain range where Angraboda displays another shrine. Kratos walks forward to it, and then opens it. It turns out that Faye destroyed the final piece of the shrine in Jotunheim. She couldn't live with the death of the Kratos and to have her boy move and work with Odin. So she did something completely unheard of and went against her people and destroyed that section of Atreus' shrine and changed the prophecy herself. The prophecy was Ragnarok. However, they allowed Kratos and Atreus to forge their own path to protect them both. So, rather than Kratos dying to Thor and Atreus going to work with Odin, the path was changed so that Thor died to Odin and that we destroyed Odin. However, of course, this was secretly done because the Norms were still following the older prophecy. So, Faye really saved the day here and saved Kratos and also Atreus. However, at the end of the game, Atreus tells Kratos that there are other giants out there in the shrines of different realms. He needs to go out there, find them, and free them, and he needs to do this alone. Kratos gives Atreus his blessing, and he takes a new step into his journey of finding the giants and bringing them back to Jotunheim. Loki will go, but Atreus remains with Kratos. However, this was not it. Kratos circles the cave when he's left on his own, and finds the other side to the shrine. Kratos opens it, and this is Kratos' shrine. It showed his journey, all the way from Athens and Greece, all the way to the end, to right now. Kratos was the champion of the war. Kratos was the god of war, the god of the people, the general leading everyone to their victory, just as Kratos wanted it. He's no longer that god of war, that killer of gods that he was once known by, but now, He's the god of the people, just like Tyr was to the giants. That is him to the Midgardians. That is him to the other realms. A path that he never imagined would be possible. What did you see in there, brother? Well. One I had never imagined. to it. 